often the thing we crave the most for ourselves is what we're best at giving other people. Mm -hmm. And when we start to give it and give it and give it, it's like, oh, wow, we finally start to give it to ourselves. Mm. So that's it. What if the key to really launching your business and getting it to the next level was just seeing people, mm -hmm. truly? Mm -hmm. What if it was that simple? Yeah. Isn't that kind of liberating? This is the best birthday ever. What, what a gift to me to get to share this day with all of you and to get to talk about my favorite thing to talk about in the world, coaching. Like, you guys aren't at a conference for dentists, right? You're in the most exciting profession. I get goosebumps. Like, isn't this the coolest profession ever? It really is. And it is because not only we think we get into it to help people, but what are, what are we really doing? We're really evolving ourselves. We're evolving ourselves. What an amazing path you all have chose. So first I just want to, well, first of all, thank you for the birthday love. That was really fun. I'm gonna, that, that's the largest group hug I've ever gotten. But second, I'm gonna say thank you. Thank you for doing whatever it took for you to do to get into this room. And I want to tell you and reassure you that the hardest part of your career is over. But really, truly, because you made the decision to do it. And that's a massive choice, and I don't want you ever to lose sight of that. When I went to my first coach, Mona, at the ripe age of 24, and I said, I want to be a coach, because I was a personal trainer, and people were telling me, you know, you should be a coach or a counselor or something like that, or maybe I was, I lose track. Somewhere in my 20s, she said, are you sure? And I said, yes, like you get to help people and it's so exciting. And she's like, but your life will become your laboratory. You will not be able to bypass anything. You won't be able to suppress anything. You won't be able not to notice anything. Your life will be full of lessons. And I said, well, that doesn't sound so great. <laughs> and she said, but it actually is because you will evolve quicker. How many of you, since you decided to become a coach, has your own evolution sped up? Right, and at times, has it been more intense? Like, you're, you really understand that phrase, ignorance is bliss? I often say ignorance is bliss, success, awareness is a bitch, right? And then, and then you get all this awareness, but things aren't changing yet? Anybody in that phase at all? Like, and then imposter syndrome comes. Because you're like, wait a second, I'm not walking on water. I'm not there. I don't have it all figured out. How can I be a coach? Anybody go through that? Okay. So what I'd love to do is share with you really what has made me successful as a coach, both internally, because I think there's, there's the outward success, there's the money, there's the following, there's all of that. But then I really feel successful as a coach because I haven't burnt out. I started coaching people in 2004, and I still have private clients. And one thing that hurts my heart a little bit about the coaching industry is everybody tries to move out of the private client world, right into the projects, the products, and the groups, and the online. And all that's great, and I do that too. But that's like a musician who never goes back with a guitar and plays acoustic at a small bar. So I hope, as coaches, part of what you do to stay in integrity is you always work one-on-one. -on -one. And part of what you also do to stay in integrity is you always have a coach. So as I share with you the things that have made me feel successful internally and then how that's been mirrored in the external world, and then I want to bring one, maybe two people up and coach live because the best way to learn is through experience. So if you're somebody that would like some coaching, it doesn't have to be on your business. It can be on something personal in your life right now and you want to be of service to the entire group and receive so much love and support, not just from me, but everybody here, start sending me that intention telepathically so, when I, so I know who to call on, okay? So first thing, I already alluded to it, first thing that I, have, I feel makes anyone successful as a coach is being your own best client. So that means having a coach, not just a business coach, but a personal, I still have a coach. I will always have a coach because I think we are out of integrity as coaches if we don't have a coach. You'd never be a personal trainer and never work out. 
So if you want to beat imposter syndrome, that's the best way to do it. If you're ever feeling, who am I to, who am I to, who am I to, all you need to do is ask yourself, am I a client of what I'm selling? Because walking the talk doesn't mean having it all figured out. Walking the talk means you're just embodying the principles and practices that you're quote unquote selling to people. And I'm not afraid of the word selling. The word used to scare me, I'm not afraid of that anymore. Because really it is, it's, it's, an, it's an invitation. It's enrollment. And what you are quote unquote selling to people is transformational, not transactional. And if I had a whole another hour with you, I'd give you a whole speech on selling and enrollment. We'll see if we get into any of it today. So it's being your own best client. It's having a coach. And here's how you also beat imposter syndrome. You coach yourself. Here's my favorite thing to do. Set up two chairs just right across from each other like this. Coach Christine sits here. Ask myself what's up. Human client Christine sits here. And I literally go back and forth between chairs and coach myself. Coach over here, me over here. Because you all are brilliant. You all are brilliant at coaching others. But sometimes you kind of suck at coaching yourself. And the only reason you suck at coaching yourself is because you start judging yourself. That's it. And comparing yourself to coaches that have been coaching 20 years. So whenever you get into that, instead of, because a lot of the coaching on getting out of imposter syndrome is connect your why and it's all about service and you got to change the world. But if that self, that self-doubt needs proof. So how you give yourself proof, you set up two chairs and you just, you experience how you create transformation within yourself. Because when you do that on a regular basis, the imposter syndrome goes away and the integrity floods in. So is everyone willing to do that as a tool? And don't do it in your head. It's very different and don't do it in a journal. I mean, I'm not saying don't coach yourself in your head and never write, but this process right here is way more impactful. And guess what? That's a tool you can also facilitate for your clients. You can set up two chairs with them, have them coach their self, themselves. You can set up two chairs and have them sit in one chair, their mother or whoever they're having a difficult relationship sit in the other and have them play both parts. So that's it, number one. Be your own best client. Second thing, <laughs> stop talking and listen more. As coaches, we want to do a good job. We so want to do a good job. We want to serve our clients. And often we think the best way to do this is to give them the answers. To have this great advice, to drop this great wisdom. And that's useful. And they may say, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. But then we're making it more about us and less about them. As a coach, I really consider myself a detective. I'm a detective and I'm a guide. And it's my job to, one, create a space where they feel safe. Because that's the most powerful thing we're doing as coaches, is to create a space where someone feels seen and heard. Our deepest wounds come from not feeling seen and heard. So please do not underestimate the power of just holding space for someone else and giving them that permission. It's one of the most powerful things we do. It's not what you say, it's your way of being with your clients. And that can be over the phone, that can be face to face, that can be over Skype, it doesn't matter. But to really hold that space for another person, we can't be in our head thinking, ooh, what NLP tool can I use right now? Or what do I say this? Or da 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 da. We have to be fully present with our clients. And this is something that develops over years as you coach more and more people. And I encourage you, coach, coach, coach. The best way to get better as a coach is to coach and to coach and to coach and to coach. That's how you get better. And really trust that the more you listen and the more you're present and the more you're with that other person, the, not the right thing to say, but the thing that's for the highest good to say will come through. And often the thing that's for the highest good to say is a question. Often the thing that's for the highest good to say is, what else? Tell me more. You don't know? Well, if you did know, what do you think? Not going off into some educational rant with them. Now, of course, as coaches, we guide. Of course, we teach. But we want to make sure we're guiding and teaching that which is for the highest good. 
So never make assumptions about what your client is telling you. I ask, I have a podcast where I coach people live on the air. Funny story about that that I want to weave in. I'll see if I can do it next. Um, and you'll hear me when people say, I want to feel confident. or I want, I'm like, what does confidence mean to you? Make no assumptions with your clients and don't be afraid to go slow with them, to have them paint you a picture. When they say words, what do they mean? When they say, I want this, I want a relationship. Okay, describe a relationship to me. What does that look like? And what would it do for if you had it? We, you have so much information as a coach, but when you're working with your clients, your detective, you're getting into their model of the world. And the more you can get into their model of the world, the more you can bring them the tools that they need. Because that's the other thing as coaches, we're not there to fish for them. It's my job with all my clients to graduate my clients. I want them to embody the tools and, and experience the transformation. And it's so much better when a client has the aha moment versus you telling them the aha moment. Because then it lands for them. Then it lands for them. The other thing that has inspired my success is I haven't given two shits. I don't have a logo. I don't have a color palette. I don't have a tagline. I don't have a strategy. I, none of those things. Do you know what my brand has been? Whatever is up for me in the moment, that's what I teach. Like whatever I've just walked through, that's what I teach. My brand started as the quarter life crisis and the 20 something journey. And it moved on from there. And then when I got divorced, I talked more about relationships. And when I was building my career, it was about entrepreneurism. It was just about what I was going through at the time. And I know I have an ideal client avatar. And I think in a way, I don't like to use the word should, but it's important. And here's the easiest way I think to do your ideal client avatar. Your ideal client avatar is you in the past. That's it. And here's the thing. Me in the past could be a 65-year-old man because it's more about the psychological profile of your client than where they live, their gender, how much money they make. My, usually my ideal client avatars are people that are hard on themselves, high achievers, they've dealt with an expectation hangover, something didn't go according to plan, they want to grow, they want to change, they want to dive deep into personal growth, and they're looking for a guide and they want someone relatable and aspirational. Simple. So when you think about who is my client, you ask yourself, where was I five years ago? Where was I 10 years ago? Where was I a year ago? Where was I six months ago? Where am I right now? And when you speak to that, that's the magic of resonance, and that's the magic of the law of attraction, and that's the matter, magic of being able to bring clients to you without having to do Facebook ads and funnels, all those things are important, hasn't been my strategy. So in, in a conference like this, I think it's important to hear all the advice and go, what works for me? Like what feels good to me? Because there, there are so many ways to grow and you're gonna find your own unique way. So funny story, so I've been friends with Preston and Alexi since we all started and you know, they gave me all this video advice, okay? And I'm like, I need to do YouTube videos. And you see Preston, he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. and their YouTube videos are energetic and they're like channeling things. And, and so I'm like, I'm gonna do YouTube video. <laughs> Jill's worked with me for nine years, so I wonder if she'll remember this. So I do this YouTube video, I set it up in my friend's, you know, backyard, and I try to be that, I try to be someone I'm not, basically. Try to be someone I'm not. And Jill, thank God for Jill, she watched this and she's like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> That is so not you. And I'm like, you're so right. It's not me. I'm not like, that's not my personality. That's not who I am. And so even though it was like, I got to get on YouTube, I got to get on YouTube, it felt like a should. Oh, gosh, please don't let shoulds drive you. Let desire inspire you. And so I, I, I started to, to reflect on what is my zone of genius? Like, what am I really good at? And what I'm really good at is coaching people. Like, that's what is my zone of genius. And so I thought, well, what if I did a podcast? Because I thought, oh, do podcasts. But I didn't really want to interview people because interviewing isn't my zone of genius either. What if I do a podcast where I coach people live on the air? 
will that work? And the technology, my blocks around technology blocked me for a while about it. But eventually I did it. And to this date, it's been the thing that's moved my needle on my business the most. And it's the thing that I love the most. And it's just me doing what I do best. So as you're leaving here today and as you're making your action steps and your action plans, I encourage you, I implore upon you, it's got to light you up. Don't push yourself doing, just because things are working for other people doesn't mean they're necessarily going to work for you. And again, the more you really embody doing the things that feel aligned to you, the more your integrity, because you wouldn't tell any of your clients, go do that because everybody else is doing that. So I ask myself a lot in my business, would I give a client this advice? What I'm pushing myself to do, would I, would I advise a client to do that? So that's the other thing. I don't know what number this is. I haven't really numbered them. But being aligned with your zone of genius and creating from there. And people told me, oh, it won't work. You won't get people to call in. It won't be real. It works. It works because I love it and it's aligned. And like Preston, I've thrown a lot of noodles against the wall. And that's, that's a, if that strategy works for you, that's great. Some of you are more strategic and you need that. It's like doing what lights you up. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, and one thing I wanted to talk briefly about before I start bringing people up. Would you like that? Would you like live coaching? Okay, okay. So just a couple more things. How many of you, when it gets to the enrollment sales part of a conversation with a prospective client, go, Ugh! and your voice changes, and it's a little hard? How many of you are killing it at enrollment? Like, no problem at all. Okay, awesome. Good people. Keep your hands up, those that are killing it at enrollment. Look at these people, because they're good people to practice with. The best way to get better at enrollment is to practice it, right? So Jill and I, we look at all enrollment conversations, all conversations when it comes to working together and what the investment is as opportunities to coach. So here you are giving these great discovery calls, coaching somebody, and then it gets to the sales part, and then where does the coach go? He or she just leaves out the window, and all of a sudden the self-worth and the self-doubt and all that stuff starts coming up. No, stay as their coach. Because their objection to you, whatever their objection is, the money, the time, i got to talk to my husband, da, da, that's an objection that's coming up in all other aspects of their life. So you've got to drop your issues with rejection to be a stand for your prospective client in that moment. Even if they end up saying no, you have an opportunity to coach them through their objections. They say, I can't afford it. I really hear you. Where else are you saying that in your life? Tell me more about how that comes up for you. What else do you want, really, that you can't afford? And then you get into a conversation about money. So, and this, this goes in your business negotiations as well. Don't just have the coach show up while you're actually coaching in an interaction. Bring that part of you to the entire engagement process. Whether you're doing a Facebook Live or a YouTube video or whatever it is, that that magic, how many of you just feel like magic comes through you when you're coaching? That's why you're here. That's why you love it. Great. Bring that magic to your writing, to your videos, all of that. Don't think you have to have a persona or have a pitch or be a certain or know what your brand is or be a certain way before you start doing that. Just bring the essence of the you that comes forward while you're coaching. And then finally, I'll just say continue to just get masterful at your craft. Have a mentor, a more senior coach, listen, like record your coaching sessions, have somebody listen and give you feedback. It just boggles my mind that therapists have to do 3,000 hours of therapy and be critiqued, but anybody can be a coach. Now, I know everyone in this room has integrity because you're in this room, but kind of like what Preston was saying before, how many people are out there coaching that maybe need a little more development? So I encourage you. Find somebody to give you constructive cri criticism and feedback. Find a senior coach to listen to a couple of your sessions, to watch you coach, and to give you direct feedback. Not from the perspective of you're doing anything wrong, but from I always want to grow as a coach. I always want to learn. I always want to know how I can serve better. How I can serve better. And then I'll round it out by saying just always make yourself your own best client. Your your sole curriculum, 
your life lessons, that's your compass for your business. Whatever you're feeling called to, to, whatever's up for you, whatever you're working through, that's your content. That's what you're here to teach, truly, because you have just walked through it. And that's how we get out of the comparison thing, because no one can teach what you uniquely got, went through other than you. And I'm just echoing what you've heard from, from Preston, from Jason, is there is no competition. There is no competition for your gifts and your divine purpose and what you're uniquely here to do. And the more you keep doing your work and the more your integrity with that, I promise the more your business will grow. Cool? Helpful so far? Okay, great. So we have about 24 minutes. Maybe I can get through two people. Is that a question you want to be coached? Okay. Well, I like it. I like the, what's your name? Catherine? Come on up. Give her a big round of applause. Okay, so your um, invitation as the audience is to hold a space of obviously presence, but also compassion. And how many of you, after you coach all day or you're with a group of people or whatever, you get a little tired and drained? Okay, so one of the, the skills that we have to really embody as coaches to be sustainable is the distinction between compassion and sympathy. As coaches, you're going to hear some hard stuff from people. You may hear stuff that makes you cry, right? I, I've heard, uh, there's nothing I, I feel like I haven't heard at this point. And how I don't take that on is I don't judge. And that doesn't mean that I don't say, oh, that person, they're so weak. It means I don't go into judgment through sympathy. So the minute someone shares something with us and we're like, oh, God, that's so hard. I can't believe they're going through it. You just judged. You just went into sympathy. And that's how we start to get depleted. Is because we feel a little of that sympathy. We feel a little bad. We feel a little over-responsible, those kinds of things. And I want you to be sustainable as a coach. I want you to feel like you, you don't get depleted. You don't get drained. Of course, we all get tired from time to time. But if you start noticing you're getting drained, it means one of two things. You're judging and feeling sorry for, right? Or your clients are triggering stuff you've got to work with inside of you. That's another reason I congratulated you and I said, this, this path is no joke. Because all of a sudden, you'll have a client sit across from you and you're like, ooh, oh, God, that's kind of me, right? And so you make a mental note of it and then you go deal with it with your coach. Cool? Okay, so... Your job as the, as the space holders and as my fellow coaches in the audience today is to hold that place of compassion, to be present. But if you notice yourself judging in any way, just go, I forgive myself for judging. Come back to your breath. Come back to the present moment. Cool? Okay. So, Catherine, take a nice deep breath. I'm going to come a little, I feel like, <laughs> like miles away from you. Okay. And hold the mic right up there. Oh, Hi. you're ready. <laughs> How can I help? Okay, so um, I so I've been working on start, starting my business. Um, I I'm an RTT therapist and a Wild Fit coach. Okay, and I've been this is my third ever coach. I've been coming ever since the first one that happened, and the first two I totally felt the imposter syndrome mm. the whole time because mm -hmm. I hadn't created anything, mm -hmm. and I was just you know on this perpetual hamster wheel of like trying to feed myself from the fire hose of learning. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> every program. So um, now I am actually feel like I'm making some progress and actually creating something. And I, right. like I signed up like four clients for my first Wild Fit Challenge. It um, started on Monday. Amazing. So so and you aren't working on building your business. You are building yeah, your business. Yeah, so I'm building it now. Mm -hmm. So, but, but a lot still comes up for me, um, you know, when it comes to having enrollment conversations. Okay, what it, comes up for you? Um... Well, like, for example, I had um, a good friend of mine who didn't sign up for my program where I, ha I felt a lot of rejection around not her saying no. But even though I know that right. she's saying no to herself and not saying no to me, right. and she's just, you know, she's following her pattern of, like, of um, making all of the excuses. So you know it here, but it still lands as rejection. Right, but it's still, but, but I still feel it in my body as rejection. Okay. So how are you doing right now sitting in this room in front of all these people? I feel a lot of energy going through my yeah. system. Okay. I feel a lot of um, activation. Okay. I feel 
um, like my, I'm on the edge of my emotional control. Yep. Yep. And if you were just to let go right now, what would happen? If I let go, <laughs> I'd probably yep. start crying. Okay. So is that, can that be okay? Can it be okay? Yeah. Just to let go? Yeah. 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 What does letting go feel like? Um, a lot of how do I do this and how do I, yeah, 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 how do I show up? And you know, I guess some of the imposter syndromes, yeah. Still so I'm scared to let go because I'm scared to let go because I might. They'll see that I'm a fake. And if they see I'm a fake, then? They won't like me. And if I'm not like, then? I'll be ostracized. Yeah. And what does being ostracized remind you of? Growing up. What happened? I was bullied mm -hmm. really severely when I was mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. What would people tell you? How were you bullied? You name it. Mm -hmm. I was... Um, I was targeted mm -hmm. like almost universally by right. kids when I right. was growing up. I definitely was a or was an outcast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and now outcast is scary. Yes, and now outcast has kind of translated to imposter. Yeah. Right? So you see right. the theme. So what have you done to work with this, the the bullied and the A lot. Okay. I've done a lot. I a lot of it's been the RTT Oh, great. Thanks. The RTT therapy that I've been working with, I've d done a lot to transform um, to f transform that. And I feel like I've stripped off layer after layer of all this armoring and conditioning. And I feel like more fully attuned and more fully aligned uh -huh. with who I am. And I mean, even people like who have met me over the past two years coming to Evercoach have come up to me and commented on how much of a shift and a change they see in my energy field and how Beautiful. I show up. So I know that there are, there's a lot there's of progress. significant change, yes. but there's still, you know, there's still layers. Okay. That are still there. So, so we can look at it like there's layers and layers and layers, and yeah. you're going to be dealing with this <laughs> till you're 90, and then finally one day it's going to be gone. <laughs> or you can look at it as like yeah. you're, you're just at the place where you're ready to break the pattern. Right. And right when we're at the place where we're ready to break a pattern, it gets stronger. Yeah. Right, so that's probably what's up. So patterns like this don't leave, mm -hmm. even after we dig and dig and dig, because mm -hmm. there's still a payoff. Mm -hmm. There's still something this pattern is attached to that's attached to one of your survival strategies, like right. getting love, staying safe, all those kinds of things. Right. So to me, it's a pattern of hiding. To me, it's a pattern of playing small, right, and retracting and recoiling. Right. How does that serve you? Um... I think playing small is, must seem more safe. Right. Yeah. Um, safe from what? Say, safe from rejection, or sa I mean, if if you if you're not if you don't fully shown up and you're not fully seen, then if I'm not fully, <laughs> if I'm not, yeah, if I'm not fully seen, then they haven't seen enough of me to know what their rejection. So their rejection doesn't mean as much. Right. Whereas if they actually see me, and then they reject me, then. It, it hurts more. Do you feel like, let me ask you this, let me ask your little girl this. Yeah. Do you really feel like the bullies that bullied you truly saw you? No, they never had Exactly. So do you have to see how your belief system is a little untrue? Yeah. That it was actually not being seen. Yeah. That it wasn't safe. Right. Not being seen. Yeah. Not being seen. What does being seen mean? Being seen, it means being being, f I had to have somebody fully see me and appreciate me and to to see the value mm -hmm. that I bring, mm -hmm. to see, you know, to to see through to my divine core, my divine self, mm -hmm. that they that they they recognize yeah. that that glimpse of the divine right. within me and they and they see it. And yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And I've had up, I've had instances where people came up to me this weekend and yeah. made comments that are basically affirm that people are seeing me. People are seeing you. Okay. 
But as long as you have that attachment to being seen, yeah. enrolling clients and building your coaching practice is right. the becoming more from your wounding. Right. Than from your vision and your service. Right. And I want to, I want it to. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to see if I can help you hold this differently inside yourself. Okay. If I had longer with you, we'd go a lot of different directions, but I want to give you something you can work with right now. So do you, you see how right now you've been wanting to enroll clients to help you heal your own wounds? Yes, you want to serve and da, 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 da. Okay. So do you see the stakes in enrolling clients is really freaking high for you and almost re-traumatizing for that little girl? Can you see that? So can you see how there's like this push-pull with building your business and enrolling clients because your own personal emotional stability is tied to it? Right. Okay. So, would you say that being seen is one of your life lessons? Yeah. Okay. So, instead of trying to be seen, mm -hmm. what if you make your primary intention mm -hmm. seeing others? Yeah. Like, really seeing them. Yeah. Really understanding them. Because what's happening is your own self-doubt, that own, mm -hmm. like, that own, when are you going to see me? When are you going to hurt me? da 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 is impacting your ability to serve and connect with people. Right. So my encouragement to you would be to lean more into where you want to go and stop trying to dig deeper into this wound right now. Right. Is this making sense to you so right. far? Mm -hmm. And in every interaction, how can I see this person? How can I see this person? Like, do with me right now. What do you see? I see... A really big heart. I see um, an um, empathic connection. I see somebody who sees through layers mm -hmm. and cuts through. Um, and there's something in your eyes mm -hmm. that's like mm -hmm. can't hide from. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what do you feel in your body when you're just seeing me? Um, I'm feeling. <sighs> A little bit of down regulation in my nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, feeling into. Do you feel yeah. the fear of rejection when you're just seen and being present with me? No. Right. So this is your medicine, my love. Mm -hmm. Your medicine is a seer. Mm -hmm. You know that. You're very intuitive. You're very empathic. But because you've got the massive fear of rejection, mm -hmm. it's, it's impacted your ability to give. And this is true for all our gifts. There's a little bit of pain and fear attached to it. So sometimes really stepping in our gifts feels so, so scary. We're all like, oh, yeah, I want to be intuitive. I want to be empathic. But that's actually kind of frightening when you get to the core of it. So part of your gift is you see people. And part of your medicine is you know the pain of not being seen. So if you would focus more on your medicine mm -hmm. than your issues, mm -hmm. things are going to start to shift for you. Mm -hmm. You've done enough work right now. Time to focus on the medicine. And your medicine mm -hmm. is seeing other people. Mm -hmm. And the more you can see that and hold for them, mm -hmm. then... One, I think it's going to help your business grow. Mm -hmm. And two, if dumb, someone does say no, you see their no as their business, mm -hmm. not yours. Because mm -hmm. you're able to see through where the no is coming from. You're able to see they're not ready. Right. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't feel safe to be fully seen yet, that's okay. You don't have to be fully seen in order to be successful. But does it feel safe to see people? Mm -hmm. So could you start there? Yeah. Could you start there? And could you start every enrollment conversation or coaching session or whatever with the intention to be seen? To see them. To see them. To see them. Because mm -hmm. that's your medicine. Mm -hmm. How does this feel? Good. What questions do you have? I guess just how to let go of, if, if I'm focusing on seeing them. Mm -hmm. If I want to. How to start that enrollment conversation. I'm, just, I'm focusing on seeing them, but right. still have to bring up what you can offer. 
Hold on. So if I want to pick up this glass with this hand, what do I have to do with this glass? You have I have to put this one down right. if I want to pick up this one. Right. Right? So you're, there's still, you're still really holding on to the fear. Right. The fear of being seen, the fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. And that's more of the block than any conversation starter strategy or anything like this. Mm -hmm. If you can put down this fear of being seen and rejection and just pick up, my medicine is seeing people. Mm -hmm. Then if you really see them, the, the, remember how I said the words just come through? Mm -hmm. It's going to come. You're going to see them. You're going to know what to say. You're going to be so tapped into your intuition. Your intuition is just blocked because of your fear of rejection. Right. You're in fight or flight mode, and so it's just blocking the channel from coming through. It's just like radio static. It's not because it's not there. But this is about trust, too. And if I had more time, I'd go down that road with you. Yeah. But this is about, I just want to give you one thing right. that you can lean into. Because that's the other habit we get into as coaches. We spend so much time processing and cleaning up and nah, 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 instead of like leaning into the new thing we want to move into, what we want to embody. Mm -hmm. So can that be the focus? Like I'm going to see people in my enrollment conversations and in, in the interaction. I'm not going to wait for people to see me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see people and I'm going to be with people and I'm going to learn how to feel safe in my own body with other people by seeing them rather than hoping or being afraid they're going to see me. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what's an, what's an action step you can take from this conversation? Just every time I engage in a conversation for the rest of the weekend, just really trying to see the person I'm talking Not to. Not trying. Well, it's just, your medicine. Yeah, just seeing. Them. Just, yeah. Just doing what you do best. Yeah. Often the thing we crave the most for ourselves is what we're best at giving other people. Mm -hmm. And when we start to give it and give it and give it, it's like, oh, wow, we finally start to give it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's it. What if the key to really launching your business and getting it to the next level was just seeing people, mm -hmm. truly? Mm -hmm. What if it was that simple? Yeah. Isn't that kind of liberating? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just final thing. Oh, you can take my hand. Thank you. <laughs> um, final thing. Can you just open your body towards the audience a little bit? Yeah. And just allow yourself to be seen. Just really breathe that, breathe that in, Catherine. Really breathe it in. And just let this be a new experience. Let this be a new anchor. Let this be a new reference point for what being seen feels like. There's nothing you have to do. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? It's not scary. Yeah. Yeah. Breathe that in a little more. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the things we long for the most are often the things we resist the most. But you're doing really good. You have so much courage. And what do you see when you look out in this audience? A lot of love. A lot of love. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful work. Thank you so much. Yeah, give her a big round of applause. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I don't think I have time for another person because I'll run over, but questions about that process. What did you notice? Oh. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, thanks. You are. Whatever, that's the thing with projection. Like we think it's just the negative things, that things that trigger us is negative projection, but positive projection is there too. So anytime we're, we admire, anytime we respect, anytime we're jealous, we spot it, we got it. So we're just seeing something in someone else that we're not fully owning inside ourselves. Yes? By not just slowing down and saying, does that make sense? Yes. Often slowing down. Yes. Yes. So he was, he's saying slowing down and does that make sense? Like always checking because clients also, they'll try to be on good behavior. So they'll just sit there and they'll be like, mm hmm, mm hmm. And you can be going on and on for five to 10 minutes and they might not have a clue what you're really talking about, but because they don't want to upset you, got a lot of clients are people pleasers too. A lot of humans are people pleasers. And because they don't want to upset you and they don't want to look stupid and they don't want to like think they're being a bad client, they won't say, I don't know what the hell you just said. So that's why it's so important to be like, does that make sense? And if they say no, go with their answer. Like even if you think you're making a lot of sense and you're on the right track, if it's not resonating with someone, 
go a different direction. So yeah, thank you for that. And don't be afraid to go slow. And I love the part of like you really focusing on one thing to take away with and just staying there until it really was understood. Yep. Yep. That's that's the other thing is like don't try to over deliver. Because guess what? Your clients are excited for a second and then they're totally overwhelmed and they don't know what to do. So that's the other thing. We think we've got to deliver so much value, do so much, do so much. Actually, <laughs> one big insight and one takeaway, that's enough. It's more than enough. Yeah, so thank, thank you for that. I saw another hand over here. Yes. I felt um, an amazing amount of compassion from you without emotion. And to me, that was so much strength and mm -hmm. it was very admirable. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really, that hit home hard for me. Thank you. Well, and, and that's, that's why I wanted to context compassion because it's not that I don't feel compassion or feel for people. I also, so a lot of us, we all have the victim archetype in our consciousness. And I also don't want to unconsciously reward them for their pain and enable them. Right? So if they're going through something hard and I'm like, <laughs> they're just going to be like, oh, this is how I get love. This is how I get attention. Because a lot of people have, when I have a problem, I get attention and love. So I will hold that space. And if I need, if I need to go deeper into it and do emotional release work with them and move the energy, I will. But I won't let somebody sit in their sob story for too long. I either want to go right into the emotion of it, like let's stop talking about it and cry. That's why I was like, what would happen if you could let go? I could feel the tears. And, and I go into it, or it's, it's like we, we move out of it. So that's the other thing as coaches is just to be aware of, of, and none of you would do this on purpose, but it's sneaky. It's like sometimes we can enable our clients in their story. We don't want to like pep talk and push them out too quickly but we also don't want to have any kind of that pity or judgment when they're going into it because it, it perpetuates that, oh, this is how I get love. We re really want to be able to celebrate them and the truth of who they are, not their story. I saw another, yes. Um, you intervened. I was sitting thinking about myself and what you said about listening. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, she's talking a lot here. Yeah. But you intervened beautifully to stop what you've just described, the dwelling in the circum circumstance. And then you completely reframed the word seeing, mm -hmm. which, you know, was the crux, I think, of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was masterful the way you did that. And for me personally... I thought the way you redirected is something I need to get better at. Yeah. Well, you probably already are better at it because you wouldn't have noticed it if you weren't already good at it and doing it. You wouldn't have been able to see that. Um, but that's the other thing, too. What, usually the presenting problem, like whatever the client says in the beginning, is, is usually not the direction. And that's why I was saying earlier, don't, you're not in the problem-solving business. You're not. Because if you solve the problem the client has to come in with that says this is a presenting problem... He, from my point of view, you haven't done your work as a coach because it's, it, there's always something underneath that that's created that. So that's where the detective part comes in, right? It's like, what's really, really going on here? And if I had longer, I would have like not interrupted as much. Well, knowing me, I probably would have at this point. But, <laughs> but it's that dance of just knowing when to interrupt and intervene because they're on a story habit, like they're on a loop and you want to help break them out of that versus when they're really talking something through and you can feel the difference. You can feel the difference between when a client's connecting dots and they're really talking something through or they're just in your, their story. And you want to be able to come in and, and lovingly, and not say, hey, you're in your story, we're going to go a different direction, but just ask a question. Come in with a question and redirect. And, and again, help, le help them lean into where they want to go instead of continuing to try to process where they don't want to be. I saw another hand. Was it your hand? Oh, okay. Um, I want to ask a question about when we are doing one-on-one -on -one coaching yes. and we go through the whole uh, conversation and we come up with the aha moment and then we come up with this little action plan. I'm actually coaching um, one client and we came up with this just one little action item, yep. right? He goes back and does it for two days Yep. and then it doesn't do it because I asked him to send me a quick a uh, note saying how it felt right. doing that and right. overcoming that one thing, right? Right. 
And then after third day, he doesn't. Then I give him a day uh -huh. as a breather. And then fourth day, I remind him like, oh, hello, how is it going? Yeah. And he says, yeah, 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 everything is going good. Uh, by the way, you know, I couldn't stop watching YouTube, you know. This okay, so stuff. we stopped being accountable, basically. Yes, and then now, now I don't know how to, I don't want to sound like a project manager or a yeah. mom. Yeah. But I don't know how to say like, see, you have to follow through. Yeah, how do I say that? You turn it into a coachable moment. You say, I notice you did this for two days, and then you didn't. What happened? Again, detective, scientist. Not like, you're not following my assignments. If you want to get results, punk, you got to do this every day, right? It's not that energy. It's like, this is what I noticed. Let's talk about it. You turn it into a coachable moment. Because every one of your clients has been parented and shamed, and they've been in school and had authority figures. You don't want to trigger that for them. But you want to hold them accountable. So you go, hey, this, what happened? Let's talk about it. This is a coachable opportunity. That wasn't working. Maybe I need to come up with something different as your coach. Talk it out. This is your place where you get to tell me what's working and what's not. Yeah. Do I have, can I do one more question? Okay, right here. And then I have to get, then I'm done. Is it on? Oh, yeah. Hi, Irina, yoga coach. Ve I love this conversation so much. I really admired how actually you drove her through the emotions and you held the space and this digging deep mm -hmm. into deeper, 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 and what if, and because that was, I just loved it Thank so you. much. And my question is here, like, while you're actually moving the person through many different emotional mm -hmm. and mental states, mm -hmm. you've been jumping in, jumping out, mm -hmm. like having this kind of, I would call it dance through yeah. emotions and deeper, 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 how do you usually end up those conversations? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like and, and actually like close up in the way that the person is in good space to right. get out after this all emotional wounding and opening up and Right. Yep. So uh, um a couple things and then my time is really out, but I'll be around. Um what did you learn? What did you learn? How do you feel right now? What do you know to be true? What steps are you gonna take? And if they can articulate all those things, then you know they're in an okay place. But usually when I do deep work with people, there's a self-forgiveness process that we go into, all that kind of stuff. But she's, she's advanced, so we could go pretty quick. But asking those four questions really help to integrate it and make sure they re say it in, in their words. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. And the last thing I'll say, kind of to doing your own work, how I've gotten comfortable with emotions is I haven't been afraid of mine. I have yelled and screamed and raged and cried so hard I thought my eyes were going to fa fall out of my head. And, you know, you've got to go to your dirty, dark, nasty shadow self. Like you can't spiritual bypass and meditate your way out of life and expect to really be able to be a transformational coach. So don't be afraid of the shadow and of the dark because we try to get, we, we, sh we shove that under the rug too much and that's why so many people are in so much fucking pain. So... Go to your dark side, get to the other side of it, and you will be able to hold so much space for the people that you serve. I love you all so much. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day.